Taxpayers are targeted by cyber criminals during the run-up to April 15th. Bogus Android security apps target users in China. A new ransomware variant appears. More on the doxing of the FBI and Department of Homeland Security. There's a new approach to installing pay card skimmers. Anonymous hits three new targets. Vigilantes go after Lizard Squad. And a toy maker hides behind its terms and conditions. This CyberWire podcast is made possible by the Johns Hopkins University Information Security Institute, providing the technical foundation and knowledge needed to meet our nation's growing demand for highly skilled professionals in the field of information security, assurance, and privacy. Learn more online at isi.jhu.edu. This is John Petrick, the CyberWire's editor, in Baltimore filling in for Dave Bittner with your CyberWire Daily Podcast for Thursday, February 11, 2016. Tax issues headline recent cyber threat news. In the U.S., the Internal Revenue Service reports that somewhat more than 100,000 taxpayers' e-file credentials have been the targets of an attempted compromise. The incident, the IRS says, was an automated attack on its electronic filing PIN application. The server says it detected and contained the attack without any loss of personal data, and that it's notifying taxpayers whose e-file accounts were prospected by the attackers. Palo Alto Networks warns that tax-themed phishing email is distributing the NanoCore remote access Trojan. NanoCore is a commodity bit of crimeware that was, according to Symantec researchers, first released in late 2013. It's hitherto been most often seen in attacks against energy sector targets. Cheap, easy to deploy, and appealing to opportunistic criminals, the RAT has been widely circulated since last year. NanoCore is modular, and Palo Alto summarizes its premium plugins functionality in a list. Key logging and password recovery, stress testing or denial of service, downloading execution or other software installation, remote CLI and UI, registry editing, SOX proxy, firewall modification, and finally, webcam and audio controls. It's worth noting that this campaign isn't confined to North America. Phishing emails have been observed in Western Europe and Asia as well. What's new here is what Palo Alto calls the installation of, quote, full-featured rat implants, unquote. What's not new is that it's phishing. As always, users should be on their guard against plausibly themed emails. When words like attention, urgent attention, and your taxes appear in a subject line, well, then, caveat lector. NCR warns that it's found some external card skimmers installed on NCR-built ATMs and also on machines manufactured by Diebold. Many card skimmers, particularly those in use of gas pumps, are internally installed to swipe card info at the bezel. But this new breed attaches instead to network communication cables external to the ATM itself. NCR advises those installing ATMs not to leave these cables exposed. And Brian Krebs advises ATM users to move on to a different machine if something looks not quite right about the one they're about to use. He's got photos of compromised cables up on his blog. There's more patch news out today. SAP has patched a problem in its manufacturing integration and intelligence industrial control system product. Cross-site scripting and missing authentication are among the likelier possible exploits for closed by the patch. Cisco's clapped a stopper over a buffer overflow vulnerability in its ASA software. This flaw could be exploited for remote code execution. SANS reports there's active scanning for the vulnerability in the wild. It's a critical patch, and administrators should apply it as soon as possible. Investigation into doxing at the U.S. Departments of Justice and Homeland Security continues. It seems likely that the attacker's point of entry was a compromised staffer account used to socially engineer an agency help desk. Those responsible, now going by the name the .govs, and probably tweeting a bit too cheekily and often for their continued anonymity, have posted their take on CryptoBin, which, according to Tripwire, has since become much less accessible as searches. This CyberWire podcast is brought to you through the generous support of Betamore, an award-winning co-working space, incubator, and campus for technology and entrepreneurship located in the Federal Hill neighborhood of downtown Baltimore. Learn more at betamore.com. With doxing and tax fraud scams in the news, It's worth considering what's at risk if someone gets a hold of some crucial bit of personally identifying information, like a social security number. The cyberware spoke to the Johns Hopkins University's Joe Kerrigan about the implications of such a compromise. Joining me is Joe Kerrigan from Johns Hopkins Information Security Institute. They're one of our academic and research partners. 
Joe, we talk a lot about securing our information, and one of the best things you can do to secure your information is choose what information you want to share with someone. Absolutely. That's 100% correct. So in a healthcare situation, uh, very often I'll go and I'll visit a doctor, and they'll ask me to uh, give them my social security number. Uh, You say, not so fast. Exactly. I never give them my social security number when, when they ask for it. They really don't need it to provide you the healthcare you need. I had an experience uh, this past summer where my wife was in for a procedure. They asked for my social security number as the insured person. And Mm -hmm. I said, no, I'm not giving you my social security number because you're a hospital. And (laughs) and I know that I I know what your what your network's like. So you're saying you could be <laughs> hospitals don't, don't you're saying hospitals have have a history of being insecure. Yeah, they, they, there's a lot of there's a lot of issues that are unique to healthcare and hospitals that that make it so that that's not a place where I'm comfortable having my social security number stored. Okay, let's say it that way. Okay. Uh, <laughs> so you know the the person at check in said this. You, we're going to need this social security number in the event that there's some kind of mix up with the insurance company and. If you don't provide that to us, that's going to be a bigger hassle to you down the road. I said, I'll take the hassle now. I'll take that hassle because that's that's a different hassle than trying to clean up an identity theft problem. Over the years, uh, the social security number has become uh, a more important piece of information. You know, I remember back when I was in college, our social security numbers were on our student ID cards. Yep, we it was it was everywhere, and nobody really worried about it. Why why have social security numbers become something to protect as of late? You need four pieces of information to open a credit card in someone's name. You need their name, their address, their date of birth, and their social security number. You think about when you were in college, when I was in college, in order to get that information from somebody, I pretty much had to know them. You know, the internet wasn't as open as it is now. We were using it, but it wasn't what it is today. It wasn't as widespread. So your social security number was relatively private at that point in time. Now I can download thousands of people's social security numbers and not only their social security numbers, but all their identifying information from some some breach somewhere uh, and just wholesale just go around exploiting that information and stealing identities, opening bank accounts and credit cards in other people's names. So it's really a matter of the the ease at which the, all that, that vast amount of information can be can be accessible compared to how it used to be. Exactly. Now we can get to that that amount of information, huge amounts of information at very low cost. All right, Joe Kerrigan, thanks for joining us. My pleasure. Anonymous is back with some new but foreseeable target sets. Recognizing that there are greater threats out there to the common wheel than the civil servants of York County, Pennsylvania, the hacktivist collectum goes after three new targets. North Korea, to protest the DPRK's presumably easily militarized satellite launch. Saudi Arabia, to protest various human rights issues and to demand the kingdom's exclusion from the Olympics until it makes progress in the way it treats its subjects. And South Africa, where a job portal is attacked to protest child labor practices. In other hacktivist news, white team vigilantes struggle with Lizard Squad, contesting control over a network of compromised home routers. In fairness to the Lizard Squad, characterizing that loose group as hacktivist is perhaps at this point misleading, given its steadily increasing participation in criminal black markets. According to Forbes, white team, which is a bit less communicative than its opposition, says that it hasn't been in any particular trouble with law enforcement. But it's worth noting that, in many jurisdictions, including those in the U.S. and the U.K., such vigilante hacktivism is against the law. Finally, you may recall the hacking of Toymaker VTech and the attendant privacy issues to which its customers were exposed. Part of the company's response is apparently to have been to revise its terms and conditions of use. Security blogger Troy Hunt close reads these and finds this text down in Section 7, where VTech addresses limitation of liability, and we quote, You acknowledge and agree that any information you send or receive during your use of the site may not be secure and may be intercepted or later acquired by unauthorized parties, unquote. One somehow doubts that this hold harmless clause would hold up under challenge, much less that it's an adequate approach to the security problems of network toys. And that's the CyberWire for Thursday, February 11th, 2016. For links to all of today's stories, along with interviews, our glossary, and more, visit thecyberwire.com. The CyberWire podcast is produced by CyberPoint International, and this is the editor, John Petrick. We'll welcome our regular host, Dave Bittner, when he returns next week. Until then, I'll be filling in. And another note to our listeners, we'll be taking Monday off in observance of Washington's birthday, but we'll be back as usual on Tuesday of next week. Thanks again for listening.